Um, we have done a lot of models of endogenous growth and things like that. We can think of agglomeration effect. But a recurring model has to start with the assumptions usually that there is a sort of a, a, a specific productivity parameter. That's the big TI that Simon had earlier. It, it comes from somewhere. It's not chosen by anyone. It is. So it's going to have the same feature. I'm highlighting that because, you know, we may have to question whether or not that can be endogenous or not, right? And then it's going to have, and then in this world, the, both domestic and foreign trade will matter because manufacturing for raccoon can be competing with manufacturing in Cotonou, but also competing with manufacturing for Abuja, right? So that's the way you want to think about the world. So I'm going to walk, so, so let's go slowly. So essentially, you're going to have K sectors that are going to be cop Douglas aggregated into a composite group. So nothing fancy here. It's just a cop Douglas across K sectors. So that means that essentially your expenditure shares are going to be constant. So that's not where they actually is. That's just a convenient way to map things back. The question is going to be, where do you buy this from? Right? And what happens when a few things change? So, so people are going to sort of, so this is going to be the first key important equation I want to share. I'm going to walk through it very slowly because if you miss this one, you're going to miss a whole part of the paper later. If you get it, you'll be on board. So let's go slowly. So, I said there are a bunch of households that are born on each island, right? So I'm going to put one island here and not one island here. Let me call this island I. Let me call this island K, and let me call this island L. This is what this equation says. It says, actually, I'm going to use exactly the same notation. So I'm going to call this island N for the location and J for the industry. So this can be code to new. And let's say this can be manufacturing, okay? So if you encode only manufacturing type T, you get to consume your composite bundle. So you buy all this good, the 12, you know, the computers, the shoes, the, the house and everything. You buy it according to utility. There's nothing fancy here. You earn your wage and you buy things. This is where the action is. Because trade is about reallocation. If you trade and nobody moves, it does not up, right? So the, each household will basically look across all possible IK islands, all the other possible location islands. This could be Paracu Manufacturing, but it could also be Paracu para Textile, or Paracu Services, or Paracu Unemployment, or Cotonou Unemployment. So you look across all your options, across locations, and across sectors. And you're gonna choose the best according to what? Well, what happens if you move? Well, first of all, there's a discount, you know, happens next period. So it's gonna matter, depending on how, what the discounting is. Obviously, if I'm very impatient, it doesn't matter, I stay put, right? There's a value for moving to that island, that location I in sector K, tomorrow. Standard stuff. This is where the trick happens. But you have to pay a cost. You have to pay a cost now for moving from NJ <coughs> to IK. This is not an iceberg cost. This is not something that melts along the way. This is something that hurts your head. If you move, it's painful. Okay? This is a number, it's fixed. So every time you jump from here to here, there's a cost now to pay. Now NJ IK. So you can already see that. These are two sides of the room, two different islands, and I pay $15 an hour here and $25 an hour here. If that tower is big enough, nobody will move. Because the wage, I said wage, but it's really the value, because a few things are gonna show up in there, has to be big enough to rationalize the move. So unlike the earlier model where usually you have to say wage has to be equalized across locations, well, not quite. This is gonna basically go in there. So this DAO is important. This DAO is essentially a mobility friction, right? From the perspective of a frictionless world, the DAO is preventing households from basically doing the arbitrage in terms of rewards to their uh, the labor they supply. Okay? But that doesn't stop there, because if that's all there was to it, then guess what's gonna happen? Suppose I pay 15 here and 25 here. And suppose tau is 
let's suppose, let's suppose tau is 15, right? So from the perspective of 15 dollar an hour, guys, 15 is too costly to pay to get 25. I don't move. But then if the wager rises to 35, everybody moves. It's bang, bang. Well, that makes a lot of things interactive. So again, they're going to use a trick, the same trick actually as the one uh, Saturn showed earlier, which is we're going to introduce the heterogeneity here. Essentially, everyone in this island is going to have a random shot epsilon ik to move there. So even if the gap is $15, right, maybe you will have a shot epsilon so high, it's a love shot. Maybe your sweet house is on the other side. Maybe your parents on the other side. Maybe you dislike this place. Whatever it is, it's going to be essentially a preference <coughs> shock that can induce people to move. Because this is continuous and random, it's always going to mean that you will always see flows between the two islands. Not because of any fundamental wage difference, but because these people are getting shocks. Right, so that means that people are moving back and forth between I and K just because of these epsilon shocks. Okay? Now what do you get if you move? Well, you typically get, you know, you move there and then you're going to get the wage. If you work and get the wage and then you basically, you know, there's a location specific price index there. Right? So why is it location specific? Why is the price in Baraku, the Cotonou different from the price in in Baraku, well, because you have a few non-tradables potentially in the model, okay? Maybe housing is more expensive in Koto. This model was built to think about the fact that in the US, we've seen a lot of sort of unemployment response um, to trade. You know, there are a few locations in the US that have been severely harmed because of trade. Well, how do they model unemployment? Many of you may have done search models and all these fancy models of unemployment. Unemployment is very trivial here. It's just a location you get to, to basically get BM. It's just another sector. You know, in fancy world, we'll call it home production and so on. But this also matters because it tells you what unemployment is in this model. It's just <coughs> a simple outside option, OK? So I've walked you through the fundamental problem of the household. You don't, you, all you have to choose every morning when you wake up is, where do I work tomorrow? You wake up and you do the work where you chose to be unemployed, depending on the sector and the location you're in. And you think about where do I move to? If you're willing to pay the cost, and if your preference shots move you enough. Yes? Yes, the cost that you are going to pay by moving to one place to another, normally should depend on the time. I mean, here you fix it like, it will not depend to move from. I don't know from location A to location B. Maybe with the cost to do that will be different yep. from moving to B to C. I don't know. Yeah. So why is it so expensive? That's a very good question. Uh, so, so for those, who, if you didn't hear the question, uh, maybe it's Lucy. Lucy. So Lucy is saying, why are you making this cost? I mean, I didn't make this. But why are you making this cost? Um, why, is, why is there no T here? Right? She's saying you get me to move randomly every other day depending on whether or not my love is on the other side or not. But why is it that the cost I have to pay doesn't, doesn't seem to depend on a few things in general? Yes. The first time I saw, uh, I used to work with Fernando at the Federal Reserve Board, and when the first version of this paper, that's one of the things I wrote about. They still can't deal with that. It just makes a lot of things messy. I will show you like, when you see a few slides on the road, you'll see how the trick they use to solve this model. Putting a T there, it's going to make a lot of things difficult. They have, what they have done is they've done something where sometimes you wake up and you pay, have to pay a cost move and sometimes you don't. It helps a little bit. But that how is a black box. We, don't, we haven't given you a theory of that, right? So I think it's a, and it's one of my last points when I, at, at the end of this slide, he, we need to open that black box. We don't know what's in it, right? Um, for instance, um, if you think that that um, industry-specific human capital, then tenure will matter. There's a very nice paper by uh, an assistant professor at NYU named Sharon Fiberman, who basically tries to capture this cost 
by taking occupations, all the possible occupations. Oh. Okay, we'll have to, uh, while this comes back up. So they take, he takes occupations and basically tries to map the cost of moving away from an occupation giving your tenure. So that's one thing you can do. So, so in this paper, we're not going to see any T on that down. It's a very important question. Okay. Uh, the second thing I want you to think about is that that epsilon I showed. Even if you get the shot to move and you get the shot to move, the model is still going to think of you guys as one household. And that's something you may not want, you may not want. It kind of goes back to the the, the, the down thing because. The model, this model is going to effectively have something that looks like a representative agent. It's going to have something that looks like a representative household for each island. And it's not clear that, while well, this is coming back up, let me put it again. Suppose you have, I'm going to say again, this is the Cotonou textile manufacturing island. What you have right now is a bunch of people that are going to get these trucks epsilons and some may move. Suppose this is the epsilon really, really high. I mean, really, really, uh, yeah, really, really high. Actually, it's, it's positive. The way this means is you want, the F you want this epsilon to be very, very negative. These people dislike IJ, so they want to move. This model is still going to think of the movers and the non-movers as one household. So it's not a careful model of selection yet. It's going to be a careful model of things that impede transition. It's going to be a nice model of getting smooth solutions for transition. But it's not going to be a good model for selection. One thing you could do is like, well, maybe I should have cotton and textile and college educated and cotton and textile non-college educated and I have two of them. But then that means more island, that means a bigger model to solve, right? So, in summary, there's nothing fancy here. One second, Samuel. Samuel, right? There's nothing fancy here except for these, two, these three things I want you to see. Number one, random shots. And they are, they're gonna, you're gonna get them everywhere. Number two, barriers to mobility. Number three, this V itself is an, an endogenous object. It's gonna depend on everything else. Right? There's going to be an, uh, an option value embedded in here. This is not just the wage tomorrow, because if you move from this island to this island, then it might be easier to move to that other island. So when you think of moving from I, N, J, to I, K, you already have to think about moving also to M, N, or something. M, I know, M, M, L, okay? So that's going to show up in this video, okay? Yes, I know. Okay, yeah. Suppose this cost is high if you have a college degree, and low if you have a college degree, and high if you don't. So, no, actually, let me do it. Let's go back to this episode. So, suppose that these shots, when you draw them, they are persistent. So, you wake up one morning and you know what kind of epsilon you have for life. That is when the shocks happen. Suppose you have a very high epsilon, you like photonu, and Lucy doesn't have a high epsilon, so she's so so apart. That means when frictions will happen, the sun nuance are going to be stuck in photonu, the Lucy will be moving off. So I will have to sort of solve the model where I know the marginal guy and how that's moving. There's has to be a cutoff or something like that. This model doesn't have that. This model will get people to move but randomly, according to that shot, because you may be a high epsilon summit today, but it's stochastic and IID. You may be the low epsilon. Source. So Lucy and you will be switching places randomly in how high or low your epsilon is. So it's random. There's movement, there's a sense in the selection because you know the high epsilon guys love location IK, so they don't want to move. This, they, it's random selection. But it's not really it's not meaningful selection. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. Alright. So, the disruptor matter, the tau NJIK here is not an iceberg cost. This tau is a barrier to mobility. It's going to matter. 
and these epsilons are basically gonna be our idea. And to make this even a little fancier, because uh, I mean, how many of you have taken to a discrete choice more than logit and stuff like that, profits and so on? So you know extreme value distribution is in all of you the next couple of days. Well, trip guys, and that's kind of what Simon was using earlier today, trip guys I figure well we can do the same. So these things are gonna be distributed according to an extreme value distribution. So you can see it already. Here you are sitting. Here you are sitting in location NJ, location N I N J, um, industry J, thinking about all these possible IPs. And so on. And there is a fixed cost you have to pay down to, to go. And then there's epsilon shocks that govern how likely you are to stay. That's a standard discrete choice in many ways, right? So all your, one second, all your econometric intuition is gonna carry over because the trade guys have figured, if we put that shot in there, this is not about you going to the, the, to the, to the computer store and choosing which phone to buy or which computer to buy or which shoes to buy, it's which island you are living. And they're gonna run with that. Now, you had a question. Yeah. So, uh, text can also be a barrier to migration. So how do you make sure epsilon is totally different from tau? How do you make sure epsilon, okay, so what they're gonna do is, that's a very good question. Essentially, this is not the assumed to be mean zero, so that's first step. So this is essentially, you could have had this be non mean zero, and then you couldn't differentiate the two. The fundamental is a question about, um, so essentially you're just gonna assume, you're gonna make a parametric assumption on this, and what you're really gonna worry about is am I identifying this parameter right? <coughs> because if this goes to zero, then this is not there, and this is high, it overwhelms this. But at the end of the day, they both, I think the best way to think about it is exactly what I showed, what I was saying earlier, which is, if there's a gap, if the tau is standing between these two, Right. What does the epsilon do? The epsilon is governing the marginal guy, the random marginal guy that's flowing back and forth. So in another paper, I'll talk to you about that, which is a very nice AER, with a follow-up by a Raphael Scarnier in Econometrica. They basically use gross flows, which is net flows, to think about it. Because the epsilon is going to drive a lot of gross flows between the two islands. You know, your, your girlfriend moves, you move. Um, you know, someone has to move, they move, or whatever, vice versa. So that's not going to be gross flows. Net flows are going to be really driven maybe more by the cloud. I'm going to show you later on an equation for estimating essentially the mu, but a little bit of identification can come from there. But at the end of the day, they both enter additively, they both look alike, you, you know, the mean zero assumption goes a long way, okay? Yes. All right. Yes. The way you define the first term of the utility and the log of the end, what do you mean by I mean, log of the end? So it just means that u is, it just means you, think of it as u is log. Yeah. And when you are, when you are adding right, okay. you get a consumption bundle that's worth the end. And since it's cut out glass across these k sectors I showed you earlier, then think of it as the BN is just gonna spread it, spread it according to the cup of us. These guys have a wage, and a real wage locally, mm -hmm. and they're gonna be, it's basically the same as the indirect utility someone showed you. Someone showed you income over price, this is wage over price, because there's nothing else happening here for this household. Okay? Are on the same page? And I'm gonna make sure I go trip over and cut off my slides again, okay? All right. So think of it as building block number one for thinking about trade and inequality. Because Simon kind of told, that, told us a little bit already about the, the trade side of things and the in industries and firms and marginal costs and things like that. This is kind of thinking a similar intuition. You're gonna have tau's here and epsilons. And I'm gonna have to make those two things meet and I'll show you how it works, okay? All right. <coughs> So, if you work out the math, step number one is that because it's extreme value distributed, you can basically rewrite the math in a way where 
because it's <coughs> distributed, distributed, you basically get this form. And if you further work the math, you get this familiar equation. The, the flows, the shares, you know, the fraction of households move from nj to ik. This is mu from nj to ik and back t. So this is a transition rate, a migration flow, right? But in the world of Simon, that would have been a trade share. There's a graphic, but I'm not going to say the word yet. But essentially, it's going to look like what? This is sort of the value of ik, uh, moving from ik to nj, more or less. And this is looking like, this is not a market access measure, although it looks like one. This is basically looking at the outside option. This is if I had moved not to ik, but to mh, what is it? And this is kind of taking essentially a composite measure of that. It's not quite an average, but it looks like the best across all the other images I have. So it's like the summation of all the places that I move. The fraction of people who move from ik to nj is increasing in the gains from moving to ik, yeah. but only related to the gains I'll have had in other places. What does that mean? If all these people move that uniformly, in fact, you can just try to cannot quite do the math, but suppose that you did something where essentially if all these guys scale up, you don't get match migration flows. But if only one of the IKs moves and everybody else is constant, you're going to get differential. So this is step number one. This essentially takes the discrete choice where we knew that the solution could be bang bang in the sense that everybody moves or everybody stays. These epsilon shocks allow us to move from the bang bang to a very nice smooth solution. Now we have an imperial solution. We think about fraction of people moving from NJ, from NJ to IK. That's the mu. It's not bang bang anymore, and that's not move nicely. It's governed by parameters we know. This new was sort of the parameter of scaling up the variance of the test shots. So the higher the new, the more likely you have people in the tail, and that can basically drive flows for instance. We are not quite done because we have these Vs. This is an equilibrium at object, just like the market access someone introduced to you. In a way, you can think of it actually as a market access from the person or a worker that's trying to choose where to live, where to sell their labor if you want. Okay? We're going to go back to this equation later, but if you stare at it a little bit, you can actually take, if you took the ratio between the mu nj ik and mu from nj to let's say i prime k prime so take the mu between these two i lines versus these two if you take the ratio this summation drops so all will be left if you took the ratio of this between two locations will be the value from moving net of the moving cost so there's a lot of nice properties about this and that's going to be important later for how we estimate the Okay? Are we on the same page? So this used a modeling trick that has its pros and cons to get an interior solution that now allows us, in the presence of mobility cost, the tau's, and idiosyncratic mobility shocks, the epsilon, to get a close from, almost a close from solution or how many people move. This didn't have to be uh, US state, and manufacturing and auto. This could be the fraction of farmers that choose to move to the city. This could be the fraction of farmers who choose across different types of crops. What I want you to think about when you see these things is not just it both on one hand a methodology and the other hand an application. Okay? All right. And obviously this kind of also will give you the law of motion of um, labor supply in each island. But if you go to look at a very high rise in productivity or something that makes wages high, people will start flocking into Cotonou, this is NJ, across all the IKs, the Paracruz and, and, and the Porto Novos and, and, the, and, the, and the Sabadus and others, and across and even within Cotonou from other sectors because this is a location sector specific. So these news are important because they give you the law of motion of labor supply, population across islands. Okay? All right. 
So we're kind of done with the household side. There's nothing more to it for now. We're going to turn to the first, the more regular set of trade. Right, because standard trade models who have just given you a household a representative that supplies in at least one unit of labor and we move on and we do all the beautiful things about socialization. Just trying to get a little bit in the way of that. Okay? Yes. Why is it new of I mean moving from musician K to musician, I mean IK to NG instead of IJ to IK? Can someone help Lucy on that? Lucy is asking, why is it that it's mu of I to NJ and not NJ IK? Does anybody know the answer to that? Lucy is asking, why is it that we're using mu IK NJ and not mu NJ IK? Okay, what do you mean by that? Uh, if you reverse the order, the previous equation can get what he is saying, but is the interpretation that you are going to give for this equation that you are going yeah. to And what is the interpretation of this? What are we computing here? Uh, moving from Yeah, this is Cotonou's uh, population to more index R. Yes. So what we need to keep track of people coming to Cotonou. Uh, yeah. So people leaving IK to Cotonou, yes. not leaving Cotonou. If you did the other round, you'll be computing the outflow out of code to the yeah. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Did you try to model the gain of solar wind by grid from the SK to the Is it if it's right to model the gain? Okay. Um, let me try to answer that. And if I don't, pull up with me. Well, the gain is clear. This guy sits here and says I'm choosing the max, the best. The gain for me is coming from really two sources. The discounted sort of option, the, the net value of moving to a new island, which contains not just the wage there, but what it may mean for moving to other places, right? Because you got, it, could, it could be that once you move to Cotonou, it's so much easier to move to Porto Novo, but if you're living in Paracu, moving from Paracu to Porto Novo is harder. So that's kind of in the DAO. Think of it as DAO as sort of connecting labor markets for you. So the gain from moving is summarized in the V. However, not everybody moves. What's going to happen in this model is that only people who have the right epsilon will move. As I said earlier, because you will be switching sides, your epsilon is not tied to you. One day your epsilon minus infinity, the next day your plus infinity. We cannot really keep track of those guys. There's no such thing as the epsilon minus infinity guy or the epsilon plus infinity guy. That's what I meant by it's a roundup. There's no properly, properly, there's no selection here. So we cannot keep track of people like that. We cannot really compute their game. All we know is that one type of epsilon moves, the other doesn't, but that type is our ID. So there's nothing we can do with that. And I think it's a criticism of the framework, but that's what it is. Does that help? Okay. All right. So let's move to the good side. You know, we, all we just talked about is one good, which was labor and how it's supplied, depending on its price, which is the wage, right? Let's talk about the other goods now, the one we're used to, the one we can ship. Well, Samuel used Taos. Here we're going to use, call, use the Kappas. So the way this model is going to work is that in each location and in each sector, you're basically going to have a pro you're going to produce essentially, uh, think of it as you're going to produce a final good. That means that you take all the possible multiple varieties in the, I have to be careful here because, so you have different sectors. But in a sector, you have different guys that produce different things. Right? So let's take the example of, let's say, water. Imagine that every river, there's a water sector, and imagine every river in Benin have its bottle of water, right? So there's going to be one specific J for water, bottled water. But there's going to be different location ends that can produce the bottle of water. Are you with me so far? Yes. 